It's for me a privilege to be here today. About five years ago, I decided to accept the challenge of becoming a faculty here at Loma Linda University in the School of Medicine, in the program of neuroscience, um, and I wanted to tackle a big problem. I'm a biophysicist, also a physiologist, uh, with a background of neuroscience, so I tried to combine things that I knew, or I thought I knew, <laughs> into a new research program. So I started thinking about this big problem, and obviously obesity is a huge problem in our society. And as we've heard today several, several times, uh, actually, uh, obesity is a multifactorial disease, multifactorial disorder. But I was very interested with my background, specifically in the neuroscience behind obesity. What factors of the brain or within the brain can control that specific phenotype and how that phenotype reflects also within the brain? So this is where I decided to put together my model. We'll start to put together my model, in which I believe that diet contributes to obesity, but also environmental stressors contribute to obesity. And those two environmental factors that are highly you know, uh, manageable uh, contribute greatly to uh, obesity and are main mediators of obesity. So this is the framework of my laboratory. Again, it's a preclinical science or basic science laboratory and we want to understand how anxiety and depression and other psychiatric disorders and conditions can contribute to obesity, specifically during the period of adolescence. And I'll explain that in a bit shortly. I believe that by consuming obesogenic diets, high in fats and sugars, Dr. Peters, you disrupt brain neurocircuitry. And by affecting that brain neurocircuitry, when you have a stress added to that neurocircuitry that is already susceptible, that changes and reflects in anxiety and depression. The problem with anxiety and depression, as you may know, is that when patients suffer from anxiety and depression, that contributes to overfeeding and also contributes to this vicious cycle. So eating bad foods affects the brain areas that are important or critical for emotional regulation, and by affecting emotional regulation, you affect feeding behaviors. So we tried to put together that in a RAD model. We needed a RAD model to prove that our idea was workable, we could work with that hypothesis. So we developed a model of high fat diet induced obesity. So we fed our animals high fat diets, a Western diet, rich in sugars, simple sugars, and um, high fat diets, saturated diets. And this is a table representing the diets that we use in our different studies. And it's a sad story because it's a standard American diet that we feed our rats. Obviously, we proved that these diets um, are obesogenic. So rats that consume those diets, they gain more weight, proving that the validity of our diet-induced obesity model. And you can clearly see this is the wheat consuming the diets. This is the body weight. It starts reflecting at week seven and nine. After they start, this is a 40% uh, high fat diet um, compared to other studies in which they use a very high or robust uh, amount of diet. We want it to be more conservative in our approach. So we use 40% and also these are adolescent rats. So they are more active and they take more time to gain weight. But as you can clearly see from this illustration on the right, rats even at the first week after they're exposed to these high fat diets, they start enjoying that diet a lot and eat a lot more than the other rats in the control diet. One of the things that we wanted to evaluate also was stress. So as a stress model, we use cats. We wanted to do something more ethological, something that will stress the animals in their natural environment. And I know that most of you will be asking the question, okay, so these are laboratory rats. How come they are stressed with a cat? They know what a cat is because it's wired in their brains. Okay, they can sense the cat, they have the sulfur receptors in their nose, and they, can, they know that this is a predator. So they get scared, and we measure their response to that stressor. So those are the key guys that have been stressing our rats for the past five years, chaos and sneakers, and they provide a very good model for stress in our, in, in our experiments. Other than that, we want to evaluate how the rats cope with stress, so we do a battery of behavioral testing, 
and within those tests, we use the elevator plus maze. And I wanted to show you how these rats behave in that elevator plus maze. In that widely utilized uh, apparatus, you place the animal here in the center, and rats and rodents, they like to experience new things. They like that novelty. But at the same time, they prefer to be safe. So they will tend to be in those closed arms instead of going to that exploration in the open arm. And actually, if I put a rat or a mice right here, right now, probably, very likely, the rat or the mice will tend to go to the extreme of, of the room, which is stigmataxis behavior. So look what happened in the experiment if you see a controlled diet and the obesogenic diet. And this is a very short clip showing that the rats in the obesogenic diet, after their stress, when they were exposed to that elevated plus maze, they tended not to get outside those closed arms. They stay within those uh, closed arms right here. You see the obesogenic diet compared to a controlled diet rat that went out and explored this open arm. When we quantify that, we observe that the rats in the Western diet, as can be clearly see here uh, with the heat maps, these rats didn't like to be in those open arms. And you compare here the control diet unexposed to the stress, Western diet unexposed to the stress, control diet exposure, and Western diet exposure. And what is clear to us, and we repeated that in different behavioral paradigms, is that the rats that were exposed to the West obesogenic diets and were also exposed to the cat odor, in this case, they exhibited more anxiety-like behaviors. Not only that, but the rats that were exposed to this uh, diet and also received the uh, exposure to psychosocial stress model, they gain more weight, which is something that is reflected also in the population. So stress, not only in the controlled diet, but also in the Western diet, make these rats ingest more calories and also gain more weight. But how is this happening? We started our hypothesis with changes in brain structure, basically predicting whether the rats will gain more weight and will become obese. And we found changes in the hippocampal volume, which is a very important area of the brain regulating not only stress responses, but also cognitive function. So the volume of the hippocampus, comparing the Western diet with the controlled diet, was reduced considerably, specifically the left hippocampus and the ventral areas of the hippocampus that are critical for emotional regulation. So you guys may be thinking, OK, so do I have a hippocampus? Yes, you do. And yes, it's also susceptible to hyper diets and obesity. We found using deficient tensor imaging, I don't know what happened here, but it looks really blurry, uh, that the hippocampus not only was affected, but the connections, the connections of the hippocampus with other very critical structures of emotional regulation, such as the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala, was affected. We used diffusion tensor imaging to characterize all the different tractography and changes in the structure of the brain emotional centers. So we still have a lot of fundamental questions that we are addressing in our laboratory. And this is a, only a summary of things that we are doing in the laboratory. Um, we are interested in, are these effects long lasting? So if you remove the diet, can you still see the effects long lasting when the rats become adults or are aging? And the answer is apparently yes. Some of the effects are long lasting if you remove the diet in our laboratory. Uh, can we restore circuits and function? We are still uh, addressing that question by changing brain circuitry using techniques such as DREADS to alter circuitry and see if we can restore function in the brain. Are these effects dependent on age? They appear to be sensitive. Uh, the rats that are adolescent seem to be more um, susceptible to these changes. And also, we started testing the effects in sex-dependent sex effects of um, the di obesogenic diet. But most importantly, I'm interested in what are the molecules, what are those factors that predict if you are exposed to stress or if you consume these diets that will change the brain structure during adolescence. And we know that there are different processes that are occurring during adolescence. One of them, synaptic pruning. Those synapses are pruned, are taken away. Those connections between neurons are taken away if they are not used during adolescence. And this is what it's shown here. From birth to six years old during adolescence, those synapses, synapses are pruned. So we showed that with the Western diet, you have a reduction in the number of dendrites and spines in the brain. 
something that is not new. A lot of investigators have shown that. But we want to characterize what is actually happening at the synapse level. What are those molecules that are affect, being affected by the diet? And we found a special type of molecule, the ERBB4, and also the neuregulins, which modulate that connection between neurons. We think that by consuming those high-fat diets, the synaptic integrity is affected, specifically those receptors, ERBB4, which mediate glutamatergic synapses. And by changing that structure, you change your resilience to stress. By being more vulnerable to stress, you will tend to eat more, and that will lead to more emotional eating and feeding. So in conclusion, consumption of a Western diet during adolescence has a very profound impact in the neural and behavioral substrates implicated in fear and anxiety. We also showed, in terms of our goal, that we want to develop a very comprehensive model in which we can address health disparities in terms of obesity and psychosocial stress. We expect that this research will bring to the forefront of clarifying environmental basis of obesity, and we think that this will contribute to improve health of disadvantaged groups and individuals who are at increased risk for stress-induced obesity. So I would like to thank my research group, particularly Perla, my grad student here, and Julio, they're both here supporting the lab, uh, and all my collaborators, including Dr. Peters. So I will take more questions later, but this is uh, the link for Thank you so much, Dr. Figueroa. Let's give him a good hand. And Johnny, why don't you just take your seat right over there?